Okay, welcome to Psych 236, uh, Developmental Psychology. Today we're talking about uh, late adulthood biosocial development. So late adulthood, we're talking about, uh, you know, the later years of your life, usually 60s and onward, okay? We're gonna talk about biosocial development today. More of the biological stuff and related stuff. Some of it is actually psychological as well, but you know, well, this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about ageism, which is psychological. It's, you know, it's kind of like prejudice. Uh, it's a form of prejudice, uh, but uh, we're gonna, but it's related to old age. So we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about all these things. So let's just get um, right to it, okay? So let's talk about old age, or we can say late adulthood. Actually, it's not politically correct to call it old age anymore late adulthood. There are prejudice, there is quite a bit of prejudice that old people, uh, you know, suffer from, okay, uh, or a uh, type of discrimination called ageism, just like racism is based on race, ageism is based on age. People are treated differently because they are older. So there is prejudice in which people are categorized and judged solely on the basis of their chronological age. They're treated differently just because of their age, okay? Uh, it shares parallels with other prejudices, okay? It is similar like in, in other ways to other forms of discrimination, okay? But just this one is based on age. It considers people as part of a category and not as individuals and can target people of any age. So you treat people differently because of their age, okay? And not really treat them as individual, individuals. So for instance, some older people uh, may be very sharp and very capable, but because they're older, you treat them as if they're feeble and disabled. That's ageism, okay? It can also affect people of other age. People who are younger, uh, we also you know, treat them as, uh, as incapable or not being very knowledgeable, okay? That's also ageism has to do with younger people, but with ageism, we're usually talking about people who are older. Okay, usually affects those people more, but that is what we're talking about in this chapter. It's about uh, late adulthood uh, and ageism is a big problem. Think about that, right? Think about how old people are, are, are treated, okay? And um, that's ageism. And we'll, well, let's continue because there's gonna be quite a bit about this. So believing in the stereotype, you know, there are stereotypes about old people that they're feeble basically, they're not mentally sharp, they have bad memories, uh, that they move very slow, that they're grouchy, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Those are the stereotypes about old people. There's potential consequences to believing these stereotypes. When ageism becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, when you believe in the stereotype as an old person, that you are not mentally capable, that you are more senile, that you are, you know, not as physically capable. If you believe that, you are more likely to become dependent on other people. You're more likely to give up when young adult norms are not met. You're more likely to give up when you don't do as well as young people, okay? You feel more feeble. You feel basically like you're not as sharp. You feel like uh, you're just not as valuable and you may avoid social interaction and may avoid caring for yourself. Cultural attitudes toward aging may also influence longevity. A lot of it has to do with culture. In some cultures, you know, um, we treat people more as being incapable than in other cultures, okay? In some cultures, they're treated more with respect. In other cultures, old people are seen as more as just being in the way, okay? But the stereotype is harmful, ageism is harmful, okay? It affects old people in many different ways. There's also no, something known, there's something known as elder speak, and is, it's a form of ageism where you talk to older people differently. It's, so it's a condescending way of speaking to older adults that resembles baby talk. You speak with them, you know, to them with short sentences, short and simple sentences. You exaggerate the emphasis of certain words, right? You repeat yourself a lot and you talk slower and with a higher pitch, like you're talking to an infant, like you're talking to someone who doesn't understand, who isn't smart. That's called elder speak. It's a form of ageism, okay? Uh, destructive protection. Elders are discouraged also from leaving the home by some younger adults in the media. You don't want your grandma, your grandma, right, going out there and having a good time 
or interacting so much with people because you're afraid she's going to get robbed. She's going to fall and hurt herself, right? Or grandpa is going to get robbed and he's going to hurt himself. That's destructive protection where you're trying to protect them, but at the same time, you are actually making it so that they are not living happy lives. They're not getting the exercise they need. They're not getting the social interaction they need, and you're actually harming them more than you're protecting them. The rates of street crime and violent crime are actually lower for those age 65 than younger adults. People who are older actually suffer less from violent crime than younger people. It is younger people who usually cause most of the problems and target other younger people usually. Older people are often targeted, but older people are not victims of crime as much as younger people. So this overprotection is actually unwarranted. Yes, it's good to take precautions, but you shouldn't do it so to the extent that you're basically enslaving your grandparents or your parents for the sake of protecting them, keeping them locked up, so to speak. Elder speak, more about elder, elder speak. Elder, elder speak puts uh, older adults at a disadvantage. When you speak to people in those short, simple sentences, right? Those high pitched sounds, right? It actually makes it worse for older people. Elder speak reduces communication. These higher frequencies that you use when you talk to older people this way, right? It's actually harder for them to hear those higher frequencies. They may not hear you as well. When you stretch out the words and speak more slowly, it actually makes it harder for them to understand you. When you shout, you talk really loudly because you think they all have hearing problems, right? That causes them anxiety, makes them feel afraid. Using simplified vocabulary reduces the precision of language. When you use simple words, right, it actually makes you a less effective communicator and it makes, you, it, makes it less likely that they're gonna understand you. Uh, victims of crime, so you can see there that basically, um, you know, to the, uh, from 2005 to 2014, so basically the older you get, the less likely you are to be a victim of crime, okay? For several reasons. Older people, they do go out less often. They do spend less time with younger people who are dangerous, okay? Um, and uh, it's just they're less victims of violent crime. So you shouldn't need to keep your grandpa or your grandma locked up in the house or your older parents, right? It's not necessary. Let them go out. Let them have fun, right? Let them socialize. Sleeping and exercise. Um, sleep. Okay, so that was all the stuff about ageism. Now we're going to talk about sleep and exercise. Uh, sleep. Uh, your sleep patterns uh, change when you get older. The day and night circadian rhythm diminishes with age. Sleep changes. Many older people wake up before dawn. They wake up before the sun comes up and they're actually sleepy during the day. So your sleep pattern changes. You actually get sleepy very early and you may take naps or go to bed very early and then wake up very early. And you don't get a lot of REM sleep either uh, when you're older. It's just uh, your brain changes, your sleep patterns change. If, allowed, if uh, older people are allowed to select a personal sleep schedule, many elders feel less tired than young adults. If you let them sleep when they want to sleep, they will be fine, okay? But you shouldn't have to keep them at this normal routine where they basically go to sleep, you know, like at 10 o'clock and wake up at 7 a.m. Let them sleep when they want to sleep and let them wake up when they want to wake up and they'll be better if you just let them select their own sleep cycle. I remember my grandfather, was like that, he would take naps during the day and he would go to bed early when it was dark and you know, he'd go to sleep and he'd wake up like at four in the morning because he would go to bed very early, but he was fine. If you allow people to sleep, they won't feel so tired. Exercise is very important <coughs> throughout your life, but it's also important when you get older. On average, only about 35% of people, a little bit more than a third of people age 65 and older uh, meet the recommended guidelines for aerobic exercise, meaning that they don't get enough exercise. They don't do enough walking or jogging or things like that. And only about 11% of them meet the guidelines for muscle training. That would be anaerobic exercise, you know, um, lifting things that are, you know, weightlifting or doing things to strengthen your muscles. When you're young, it's weightlifting. I wouldn't recommend that somebody who's older be weightlifting, although some do. But there's other ways in which you can strengthen your muscles. There's other exercise machines or other uh, routines, staying active. You can still lose, uh, lift weights, just make sure that you lift things that are appropriate, right, for your 
amount of strength, okay? But yes, older people need exercise. They need to, they need to jog, you know, and they don't have to go very fast. They need to jog, they need to walk right? They need muscle training, right? Not just sitting there in a rocking chair, letting the life go by, right? And you get what happens there is that affects you mentally and physically. You need to stay active physically and men mentally if you want to stay healthy or longer. The demographic shift. Uh, yeah, our demographics have been shifting and we're not talking here about race. We're talking about age, okay? There's a shift in the proportion of the population of various ages, right? Older people, uh, I mean, once there were 20 times more children than older people. There used to be a lot more children than older people. And now we're finding that there's a lot more older people. There's a lot of people getting old. There, used to, there was this baby boom. I think it was in the 50s or something. A lot of children were born. And uh, now all these people are older. And they're getting older. And we have a lot uh, more people now who are older. Nearly 8% of the world's population um, and 15% of the U.S. population are age 65 or older. A big chunk of the population is old. Okay, that's the shifting demographics. The demographic period is no longer accurate. We no longer have this pyramid, that, this thing that looks like a pyramid, where you have a lot more younger people and less older people. People are living longer now. There's, there's a bunch of old people. So that graphic representation of population as a series of stacked bars in which each age cohort is represented as one bar with the youngest cohort at the bottom, uh, it looks different now. It doesn't look like a pyramid. I should have put an image on there, but it doesn't look like a pyramid anymore. It looks more like, I don't know, it, look, it, um, it looks more like a potato now or something like that, okay? There, I mean, there, it's just, it's, the, it's wider, even at, at, at old age. There's a lot more people who are older. There's a lot of people of different ages including old people. It used to be that old people didn't live that long and there weren't that many old people. Now a lot of people are living longer. We have a bunch of old people. The flip demographic pattern is not yet universal. So it's not in all, all countries, all nations, right? Uh, most nations still have uh, more people under age 15 than, than people over age 64. If you look at countries like India and other less developed countries, uh, they still have a lot of young people than they do have uh, older people, that's because those countries are poor, people don't live as long, they don't have, medicine is not as good, healthcare is not as good, and pe people there still have a lot of children. As, as an economy, as a country develops economically, what happens is people start having less children, and then what happens is that people get older, and there's not a lot of children, not a lot of people in the middle as well, and, uh, and then older people make up a larger population. And all, older people also live longer because of healthcare uh, improving. Worldwide, uh, children outnumber elders more than three to one. There's still more children in the world uh, than, uh, than older people. But it used to be 20 to one. There used to be 20 times more children than old people. Now there's three times more children than old people. And think about this, what this means for economics, <coughs> what this means for healthcare. There's a lot more people who need healthcare. There's a lot more people who need medication. There's a lot more people retired and living off of social security, living off of their retirement income, whatever they've saved, whatever they have. The United Nations uh, predictions for 2015 were that uh, there were, uh, what is it, 1,915,808,000 1, people younger than age 15 and about 608,880,000 uh, older than 64. That's about a ratio of three to one, okay? Not until about 2075 is the ratio projected to be one to one. When we get to about 2075, it's predicted that there's gonna be as many uh, people who are basically uh, in late adulthood, like 65 and older, as there are children. And it's predicted that we're gonna have a crisis at that time, that our hospitals, our healthcare will not be able to handle all those people who need healthcare, who need medicine, who need checkups. Uh, it's not just young people who need that, children, but older people also need that a lot. In the middle, when you're in the middle, when you're a teenager, you're a young adult, you don't need as much health care, but you do need it when you're very young and you're very old. And already in the U.S., we're already having problems with that. There's already not enough health care, not enough hospitals, not enough doctors to see all the people, which is why, you know, we have to make appointments and we have to wait two, three weeks, sometimes months for the doctor to see us. And then we go there with an appointment and we still have to wait for hours many times. That is why we have this kind of healthcare. 
there's not enough healthcare for the amount of people that we have. And it's gonna get worse. Let's talk about the young uh, people who are young, older, and the oldest. Here's the thing, when you're talking about late adulthood, people vary, okay? The stereotype is of the oldest old, that people are kind of physically not very capable, mentally not all there, but there's different categories of uh, basically of late adulthood. There are those that are, in, that are in the young old category. These are people who, yes, they are older, maybe 65 and older, but they're healthy, they're active, they're financially secure and independent. Those are those who are doing well. It's those who are still doing very well, despite the fact that they're old. And then there are the old, old, the ones who are basically uh, have suffered some losses in body, mind, and social support, but they still take pride in self-care. They're still independent. They still take care of themselves, but they're older. They're not as physically capable. They're, you know, they're, uh, you know, they have, have some physical and mental losses. They're old, okay? But they can still take care of themselves. And then there are the oldest old. These are the ones that are dependent, the ones that are most noticeable, the ones that are, that are in wheelchairs, the ones that are always sick, the ones who are in the hospital, the ones who need to be taken care of all the time. Those are the oldest old. Physically and mentally, uh, they are the most, uh, the most, uh, they're the ones that are suffering the most, the most sick, so to speak. And here's the thing, um, we'll get there to being the oldest old. Sometimes you get there when you're in your 60s or if you're healthier and you live longer, you might get there when you're in your 80s or 90s. But if you live long enough, you'll get there. But the point is to spend less time being sick, less time being feeble, less time being so physically incapable. And we'll talk about that. Let's talk about selective optimization and compensation. So here's the thing, people get older and their senses get worse. Physically, they're not as capable. Mentally, you know, things may take a little bit longer. And so we need to be aware of uh, strategies to optimize our thinking, optimize our behavior, and to compensate for some losses. So every compensatory strategy involves personal choice, societal practices, and te technological options. We need to compensate for the fact, maybe our vision, for instance, is not as good. So we can compensate for that. For instance, by wearing glasses, that's a technological thing. It's also a choice, right? You decide to wear glasses instead of, let's say, contacts or instead of not wearing anything and just having very bad vision. But societal practice, the things that you do to take care of your vision and your hearing and things like that. So you can use strategies. You can do things to compensate for the fact that your senses are not as good as they used to be, that your mind may not be as sharp, that physically you may not be as capable. You can do things. Selective compensation occurs in many levels. It incurs, so you can compensate at the micro system. We'll talk about what that is, the macro system and the exosystem. We'll talk about that. Three examples include sexual intercourse, driving, and the senses. Yes, sexually, you will change. Uh, your ability to drive, your ability to use your senses will change. And there are ways that you can compensate, that you can make up for these losses. And we're gonna talk about those. The micro system. Okay, so compensating for things at the microsystem level. We'll talk about sex. Most uh, older uh, adults uh, remain sexually active throughout adulthood. Older people have sex too, okay? Intercourse is less frequent. They don't have sex as often as young people. Um, and other behaviors become more important. To become intimate uh, with your partner, it's not just the sex, but it's the kissing and the hugging and, and other things that make you feel loved, okay? Young people focus too much on sex. For older people, yes, they have sex, but they care about those other things as well. And they care more about those things that young people will often overlook, okay? Uh, married couples will adjust to whatever the, uh, biological changes occur in their sexual arousal. But many, many also improve their relationships in the process. So you'll adjust, you might have sex less often, uh, you might take a little bit longer to get ready. You might need to take Viagra or something else to be able to perform uh, sexually, right? Uh, but they'll also improve their relationships. You will, you know, if you stay together long enough and you love each other, you will get, you will grow closer over the years. And you will feel, uh, you will have a still a strong bond, but it will be different. Your relationship will actually get better with age. 
okay, if you have a good relationship. A five nation study, United States, Germany, Japan, Brazil, and Spain found that kissing and hugging, not intercourse, predicted happiness and long lasting marriages, right? That those things are more important than the actual sex because sex is uh, different when you're older, okay? It doesn't happen as frequently. It doesn't take as much importance. Your body's changing physically and um, you're gonna compensate with other things by doing more hugging and more kissing, okay? Um, there's other things, other changes that occur like your ability to drive. So now we're gonna talk about the, an example at the macro system, that is at the micro system. So you think of it like this way, think of it like it's more at the individual level. The macro system has to do with, uh, with other changes that have to do more with uh, you know, society and things like that, okay? So driving, so older adults, uh, you know, drive more slowly so they don't get into as many accidents, okay? They're actually less likely to get into accidents than younger people, okay? Because they know that their senses are slower, that their reaction time is slower. So they actually drive more slowly so that they can drive more carefully. And it's actually a good thing, but I know you get annoyed when you're young and you're behind these older people, but they drive more slowly. They may not drive at night as well, right? Or when there's bad weather, or may, they may give up driving altogether uh, so that they don't get into accidents, so that they can protect themselves. But at the point is they make changes, okay? There's societal benefits for age-related driving, okay? Uh, deficits are, okay, societal benefits for age-related driving are generally not available, but there are benefits, okay? But they may, they may reduce the number of accidents and provide more independence, okay? So older people, for instance, the fact that they drive slower means usually means there's gonna be less accidents and that's a good thing for society. And um, you know, it also means that they get to stay independent by driving more slowly, driving differently, driving only during the day, not at night. They can keep their independence, they keep driving, right? Um, and that's a good thing, okay? Driver competency testing is not required in most states. In most states, uh, you don't need to prove that you can still drive when you're uh, older. Remember how you renew your license? As long as you haven't had accidents and things like that, you get to renew your license uh, by mail or even on the internet nowadays. And you don't have to go into the DMV and take a driving test again. Um, that means that there might be some people who are older who shouldn't be driving anymore who are still driving. And that can be a risk, okay? But um, they've tried to change the law in some states, but they haven't been able to because uh, older people vote in larger numbers and they won't let them change the law. And it is discrimination, by the way, to have uh, more testing for older people than younger people just because they're older. Just because they're older doesn't mean they can't drive. And like I said, they compensate for the fact that they're older, their senses are slower uh, by doing other things and to keep themselves safe and other people safe. Exosystem, uh, the census. All senses uh, become slower and less sharp with each passing decade. Yes, there are things that happen you know, uh, with your senses. So there's losses that occur for touch. You're not as sensitive to touch, uh, pain, taste, smell, sight, all those things, all those things change, right? Your sense of smell, your sense of taste is not as good as it used to be, right? You can't see as well, you can't hear as well, usually when you're older. Um, specific, uh, these specifics depend on the person's unique genes, right? Genetically, some people age differently than others. Some people just lose their hearing faster. They lose their sense of vision faster than others. Also past practices. If you worked in an environment where you heard there was, you were exposed to a lot of loud sounds, maybe because you were using a, you know, a jackhammer your whole life or something like that, or you went to a lot of loud concerts, all that damages your hearing and you're gonna lose your hearing faster. The current demands of your, uh, you know, of your senses, right? If your vision requires for you to read a lot, right? Be on the computer a lot, right? You're putting a lot of demands on your vision and that affects your vision. And in my job, that happens. I read a lot. I have to be on the computer a lot. And I feel that my vision is declining faster than I would like, okay? Manufactured devices and uh, built constructions can compensate for sensory loss. There are things that can compensate for that. You know, uh, there's hearing aids. There's glasses, there's all kinds of things. Just to name a few examples, right? Uh, that can help you overcome uh, these sensory losses, to help you compensate. And that's at the exosystem, right? When you're using technology. Technology can compensate for almost all sensory loss, okay? 
Uh, visual problems, you can use brighter lights. Yeah, I have to turn up the brightness sometimes on my phone or on the iPad so that I can read better, okay? Because the font is really small. You can use bifocals, use glasses, right? Cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration can be avoided, right? If you take care of your vision and it can be mitigated. It can be, uh, they can be corrected, those problems if you're diagnosed early enough. There, is a, there are visual aids, elaborate visual aids that can help, right? Um, things that can help like using a cane to help you walk, right? Or to help you, you know, see if objects are near that you might trip on, right? There's infrared lenses that allow you to see in the dark. You can use service animals, okay? To, you know, to, service animals can be used to guide people who are blind or who don't see very well. There are computers that can speak to people, right? You can have your computer talk to you and read to you what's on the screen if you can't see it very well. There's all kinds of things like that that can help you. And here's some examples here. Uh, the, um, the images, the one on the upper left, that's normal vision, which I believe I still have, although my eyes do feel a little bit more tired at times. And then you have uh, macular degenerate, no, blurry vision right there on the upper right. That's someone with blurry vision. You might need glasses to correct for that. And then someone with glaucoma on the lower left, right? It's also called, it's also called uh, like tunnel vision. See, it looks like you're in a tunnel. And macular degeneration where basically the uh, layers of uh, in the back of your eye are degenerating and falling apart and that's what's happening. Uh, a lot of these things can be corrected if diagnosed early. Uh, blurry vision that can be compensated for, uh, glaucoma, macular degeneration can be uh, you know, corrected if it's caught early enough or it can be avoided. Let's talk about hearing. There's uh, gonna be more hearing losses as you get older. Auditory problems, um, you know, how many people have hearing problems varies, okay? But everyone loses some hearing with age. Everyone's hearing get worse. In the United States, 39% of people over age 65 have some hearing difficulties and 88% of them are classified as deaf. They basically meet the criteria for, for deafness, okay? And it gets worse as you get older. The rates among men are twice as those of women. Men will lose their hearing much faster than women and will have worse hearing than women. My grandfather, when he was in his 80s and 90s, you basically had to shout for him to hear. You had to be right next to him and you had to shout. You couldn't, he couldn't hear. And he refused to wear a hearing aid. He didn't want to. And by the way, hearing aids are expensive. Thousands of dollars, a couple of thousand dollars for probably the cheap ones, okay? Um, we tried to get one from my grandfather. He didn't want it, okay? High frequencies are uh, lost a lot more quickly than low frequencies. It's harder for you to hear high frequencies when you get older. Hearing aids and uh, hearing loops help people with hearing difficulties. But like I said, they often refuse to wear them. All systems together. Okay, so let's talk about aging in general, okay? Pri there's different types of aging. There's primary aging and then there's secondary aging. And you need to know the difference. Primary aging, we're talking about universal. They happen to everyone. Universal, irreversible physical changes that occur as people get older. Some examples, for instance, uh, your heart pumps more slowly as you get older. Your heart doesn't pump as quickly. The vascular network is less flexible. You know, your uh, veins and arteries, all that stuff, they're less flexible. And of course, that means you're more vulnerable to having a heart attack, a stroke, that kind of stuff, right? The lungs and kidneys uh, function less effectively. So uh, you can't breathe as dip deeply, right? Um, you don't have the stamina you used to have. The kidneys uh, don't function as well to filter out toxins and things like that. So, you know, it, you shouldn't be, to tell you the truth, uh, doctors caution that when you're 65 and older, uh, you shouldn't be drinking that much alcohol let alone taking those other illegal drugs, right? You may be on other drugs, but uh, smoking, cigarettes, all that stuff, uh, really bad for you when you're older. Maybe it's okay to have a glass of wine every now and then, but you shouldn't be drinking to get drunk anymore, okay? Your body doesn't filter out uh, those toxins that effectively anymore. Digestion slows. You're more likely to have problems with, uh, with constipation and more likely, by the way, to have an overactive bladder. You have to go pee all the time. 
Healing takes longer from illness and accidents. When you do get sick, whether you get a cold or even if you fall and you break a bone, it takes longer for the body to heal. Now, there's also something called secondary aging, which is different. Primary aging is, just has to do with that inevitable aging that's just going to happen. Okay. Secondary aging, we're talking about things that happen when you get older that, you know, you can really prevent or do a lot to basically uh, to help. Okay. So secondary aging refers to specific physical illnesses or conditions that become more common with aging. They're more common when you get older, but they result from poor health habits, from having genetic vulnerabilities or other influences that vary from person to person. So things like obesity, it's more common when you get older, but you don't have to be obese if you take care of yourself, right? Obesity from lack of exercise or COPD from smoking, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary, pulmonary disease, I think is what that stands for, uh, from smoking. Illnesses, diseases that you can develop when you're older, they're more common when you're older, but you don't have to get them if you just take care of yourself. And there's plenty of people who don't take care of themselves. There, most people do not exercise enough, as we've heard. Most people probably don't follow a healthy diet. Uh, most people don't smoke now, but there's still a lot of smokers. But drug use and all that stuff, your, the damage uh, you're doing uh, to your body is gradual, and it's going to catch up with you when you get older. You're more likely to get certain diseases. Uh, compression of morbidity. Ultimately, what we want is we want compression of morbidity. Uh, what that means is that... Uh, you know, you will get to that period of time when you're the oldest old, if you live long enough. That means when physically, mentally, you won't be that capable anymore. But you want that period of time to be very short. You want it to be compressed. You don't want to spend a lot of time in those years. If you don't take care of yourself, you're going to spend decades in that period of time. You're going to be sick and unhealthy for a long time. But if you take care of yourself, you can remain healthy into your 80s and may not experience that real physical decline or that extreme physical decline, mental decline until you're in your late 80s or even 90s, okay? If you take care of yourself. There are plenty of examples of people who are in their 80s or even 90s that are still mentally there. And we'll talk about what it is about those people, okay? Um, so short, the shortening of the time that a person spends ill or infirm, you know, physically, mentally sick before death, right? That's compression of morbidity. It's accomplished by postponing illness. You wanna take as long as you can, right? And getting to that period of time when you're very sick and very ill. It's due to improvements in lifestyle, right? Making better lifestyle choices, improvements in medicine, and also technological aids, technological advances that help you keep, stay active and healthier longer. Look at this woman right there, still doing yoga, if that is yoga, right? Those stretching exercises, right? She's physically healthy, even though she's probably in her 80s or maybe even 90s. She's not in her 70s. She's probably in her 80s, okay? Um, it's dependent on personal habits and systemic influences. It's dependent on the things that you've been doing throughout your life, the habits, the choices you made, but also other influences, other things, you know, uh, genetics. Some people are just genetically healthier than others. They're going to live longer. They've acquired better genetics. This woman, actually, it says right there, she's 92. This woman at age 92 shown here, she can balance on one leg in the tree pose, stretch her hamstrings in the downward dog, and then relieve any remaining stress in the cobra pose. Yeah, that's that's uh, yoga. She can do that stuff. She's 92 years of old, of age, right? That is not very common. Most people who are in their 90s, no, they're going to be, you know, on a rocking chair, uh, bedridden, in a wheelchair, right? But if you take care of yourself, and there's many ways to do that with diet and exercise and technology and staying active physically, mentally, socially, right? Then you're more likely to have uh, less, uh, period, le less years in your life in which you're gonna be very sick and very ill. And that's what you want. That's called compression of morbidity. morbidity. But if you don't follow a good diet, you don't exercise and you don't take care of yourself, then you're gonna spend more time uh, being very sick physically and mentally. The effects of falling. Falls are very dangerous when people are older. They're very dangerous. Uh, with age, bones become more porous. That means they become brittle. They have more, they, they have microscopic holes in them or not even microscopic, but they have holes in them. They're not very solid. They lose calcium, they lose strength and they're more, they break more easily. 
It can lead to osteoporosis, which really means brittle bones, right? And the bones can break more easily. When you're young and healthy, you fall, it's no big deal. You get back up and you're fine for the most part, right? Uh, you know, you shake it off, you, maybe you get some bruises. When you fall, when you're older, that is dangerous. You will more likely break a bone and, uh, and become disabled afterward. Uh, it's a very dangerous thing. Uh, the most common uh, liability that elders experience from falling uh, uh, is, uh, is from, the most common liability that elders experience from falling is fear. A lot of people who are older are afraid of falling. They know how dangerous it is for people who are older. So because of that, they reduce their activity, which causes them to become even sicker. Because people are afraid of falling, older people, uh, you know, they walk less, you know, they may not jog and ride their bikes and things like that uh, because they're afraid of falling and getting, you know, very hurt and becoming disabled. So because of that, they reduce their activity and that makes them even sicker because activity will actually help keep your bones stronger, keep your muscles stronger. Okay. That's just, uh, that's just what happens. A fall that breaks a major bone can lead to death for about 10% of uh, uh, those who suffer from osteoporosis. Uh, lead to death for 10% within a year. And it contributes to, uh, uh, to morbidity uh, for, uh, for, to the other 90%. It's just very dangerous when you're older. As a matter of fact, here's the thing. Uh, when you are older, it's just, uh, you know, you need to be very careful. And that's why a lot of older people don't exercise very much, don't get out very much. But uh, you're more likely, you know, if you fall, you're more likely to break a bone. And then, uh, and then when you break the bone and you're disabled and stuff like that, you're more likely to die within a year. A lot of people die that way. That's what happened to my uh, wife's grandmother. She was already in her 90s. She had a person taking care of her around the clock. She's a wealthy woman. Person taking care of her around the clock. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, she would, a uh, person would help feed her and she'd watch a lot of TV, help bathe her and things like that. And there's one time she fell while taking a bath, right? She was having help, but she fell and hurt her head, hit her head, right? Uh, and um, she died months after that because she damaged her brain. She lasted a little bit, but that's why she died. She died of a fall, basically. It happens to a lot of people, okay? Uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of osteoporosis is now available. There are ways to prevent osteoporosis to keep your bones stronger. There are medicines, of course, physical activity also helps, right? You want to make sure that you keep yourself strong and healthy. That means physical activity. That means may mean certain medication prevent you from losing calcium. Women are, by the way, are more likely to lose calcium as they get older. Women are more susceptible to this, especially white women of European descent. Now, why do we get older? There are theories of aging. Why do we get older of all, at all? Why don't we stay healthy and, you know, and physically capable until we die? Right? Why do our bodies have to wear out? So there are theories of aging. One of them is called the wear and tear theory of aging. It says that uh, um, wear and tear is a process by which the human body wears out due to passage of time and exposure to stresses, stressors, okay? The wear and tear theory of aging says that our bodies just wear out over time as we use them more, right? We use our mind, we use our vision, our senses, we walk, we use our muscles, and our bodies wear out over time, and then we die. That's the, what the wear and, wear, that wear and tear theory of aging says. If you eat a lot, then you're likely to die sooner, especially if you're obese, because the wear and tear theory of aging says that your body has to process all these calories, all these nutrients, and it wears out your body over time. So there is something known as calorie restriction that some people are studying and some people do uh, to help themselves live longer. What it means basically that you don't eat as much and your body ages more slowly if you're thinner, if you don't eat as much, you age more slowly and you last longer. People who are obese usually don't last very long. People who are obese are more likely to die in their 40s, their 50s, even their 60s. It is very rare that you see someone who is obese in their 80s or 90s, even in their 70s. I see them in their 50s and 60s. I don't really see very old people who are obese. Okay, 
And this theory says that the body wears out with the things that you do to it. You're eating all that unhealthy food, eating all those calories, right? All, you know, all those things that you do, it wears out the body, smoking, all this stuff, you're wearing out the body. So if you actually take care of yourself, um, according to this theory, your calorie restriction, that if you restrict calories, right, you'll live longer. They've done experiments with animals where there's one rat, they feed it a lot and the rat gets overweight and obese. And, is, and it ages more quickly and is uh, more feeble. And the other rat is, the calories of that rat is restricted. They keep that rat thinner, not starving, but they keep it thinner. And that rat looks a lot healthier and doesn't look as old and is just more active. It's the same thing with people, right? Staying a, a healthy weight is actually important for staying healthy, okay? But that's just one example. But your body, according to this theory, just wears out over time. And it also suggests that if you walk more, you exercise more, run more, that you're going to wear out your body faster. So that doesn't really seem to fit in with our experience. People who exercise actually stay healthier and live longer. This theory suggests that those people would die sooner because they're wearing out their body sooner. It's basically, it basically says that, you know what, your heart only has so many beats that it's going to give you. And when you run more, right, you jog, you do a lot of exercise, your heart beats faster. You're using your body up faster. And it says that you're going to wear out the body faster. And therefore, you're going to die sooner. But it doesn't occur that way. Here's what actually, here's what happens, I think. When you exercise, you jog and, you know, and you bike ride, do all these things. That increases your heart rate. But it only increases your heart rate while you're doing those things. And because you get healthier over time, you actually slow down your heart rate over time. And you actually list, de decrease uh, blood pressure and things like that. And most of the time, your heart actually will beat slower. So over time, I it actually protects you to exercise. Because yes, you do speed up your heart rate when you're using your body a lot. But then while you're resting, you're more relaxed and your body works more efficiently and uses up its nutrients. It and it, uh, well, uh, not nutrients, but it uses up, uh, the body gets used up less, okay, when you're relaxing. Uh, there's a theory that, uh, that uh, has to do with a genetic clock that says that we have a genetic clock and we are programmed to die at a certain age. A mechanism in the DNA of cells that uh, regulates the aging process, it makes us get older. It triggers hormonal changes and, uh, and uh, you know, triggers things like cell death, right? And could control cellular reproduction and repair. So our bodies, uh, as we get older, um, you know, this theory says that we have a genetic clock and that when we get older, basically the cells uh, reproduce less. Or they basically make more errors when it comes to reproduction. And, um, and it triggers, and that this genetic clock triggers changes to take place for your body to begin wearing out and for you to eventually die. This affects the average life expectancy. You know, uh, people could only live so long. Uh, it's not like we can take care of ourselves and then live hundreds of years. That won't happen. We have a certain life expectancy. No matter how much we can take, we take care of ourselves. We cannot live beyond a certain life. Okay, there's a maximum lifespan that seems to be about 120 years. You can't really live longer than that, no matter what you do. Okay, um, and some people are going to die sooner than others because some people age faster than others according to their genetic clock. There's a theory of cellular aging. Um, cellular aging uh, basically refers to the cumulative effect of stress and toxins that causes cellular damage first and eventually the death of cells. Cellular aging has to do with the death of cells. It basically says the cells could only reproduce so many times. Over time, they build up more errors, more toxins with all the things that you eat and the, thing, the damage you do to your body. It builds up over time. And then the cells eventually die. This has to do also with the... Um, genetic clock where cells are actually programmed to die. They're not supposed to live forever, okay? And they do reproduce and they, they replace themselves, but eventually that becomes uh, more and more problematic. There's more errors in reproduction of the cells and, and, then, the, and then that causes damage and, and these errors build up and then you start looking differently and then you die. You're more, you're more uh, prone to illness and disease as you get older, your body gets weaker. The Hayflick limit is the, basically the number of times a human cell is capable of reproducing, capable of dividing into two cells. There is a limit to how often a cell can reproduce. And after that, it can't reproduce. 
and basically means that eventually you're going to die. Your cells can't reproduce anymore. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes. They become shorter as time passes. The cell reproduces, and the telomeres, as the cell reproduces over and over again, um, they get shorter. Calorie restriction can slow down the, this aging process, according to, uh, to research. And by the way, researchers um, uh, are, study, uh, are studying these, these things a lot and trying to find out how we can keep the telomeres longer, how we can extend, you know, if at all the Hayflick limit, which doesn't, well, seems to be not really possible, but how we can keep the cells reproducing without committing so many errors, how we can keep uh, the body going longer. And if we can find out how to do that, it might be possible that in the future, we might be able to live longer, 200 years or something like that. But before we can do that, there have to be some breakthroughs and we have to basically figure out aging and what causes it and how to reverse it or even stop it. It might be possible to do that in the future, but they've been studying this for decades and they're getting closer and closer to doing certain things to help people live longer. But you can do more for yourself with the things that you do than doctors can do for you, by the way. There are centenarians. There are people who live a long time. Centenarians are people who make it to 100 years of age. Uh, why do certain people make it to 100? And most people don't. There's, there are comprehensive studies that found that uh, these people have certain things in common, that these people who live a long time have certain things that are common about their diet, about their work, their family and community, exercise and relaxation. First of all, they follow certain kinds of diets, healthier diets. They're more likely to stay working longer. Instead of retiring early, they work longer and they enjoy their work. They're more likely to stay connected with their families, their community, and they're more likely to exercise and relax. Maximum life expectancy. So speaking of maximum life expectancy, the, old, the oldest possible age to which members of a species can live under ideal circumstances. For human beings, it seems to be about 122 years. That seems to be the, about the maximum, that we can't really live longer than that, that it's just not possible. It may be possible in the future if we find out how to cheat and change the body, change ourselves biologically by altering certain things. And, and they are doing that and studying those things. Or maybe what can happen in the future, maybe we'll become part machine, part robot, part artificial intelligence. Some people are suggesting that that may be possible in the future. Average life expectancy is different. Average life expectancy has to be do with the average, right? When you study a bunch of people and you calculate the average, each species seems to have a genetic time table for decline and death, okay? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about human beings, you're talking about cats, dogs, they have a certain life expectancy, like how long they live on average, and then some live longer, some live less, but there's an average. Okay, although the average life ex lifespan has clearly increased, right? We do live longer on average. It is disputed whether the maximum can increase, right? Some people say, no, we can't really increase the maximum, right? Some people say, yes, we can. If we make, with certain te technological improvements, improvements in health and medicine, we may be able to live beyond that. Dramatic variations exist from nation to nation. And some people, in, in some countries, people live uh, less than others. In some countries, the average life expectancy might be like 35 years of age. And it's not because of what you think. The reason those people don't live as long is because they live in a country that is always at war and people are always getting killed and people don't really have a long life expectancy. And by the way, in the past, hundreds of years ago, uh, the average life expectancy was also like maybe in the 30s. People didn't live very long on average. By the way, the rich people did because they were better able to take care of themselves um, they, uh, they were not likely to, to be robbed and killed or die of starvation. People didn't live very long back then because they were killed, because they starved to death, things like that. Things have changed. We live longer now, but in some countries, people don't live as long because their countries are at war. In other countries, people live longer. There's a lot of old people in Japan, for instance, greater percentage of them that live longer. And in other countries, certain parts of Italy and certain places. But, um, you know, that's the average. It, it depends on what is going on. And uh, that's it, you guys. I'll, that's the end of the, the chapter. I'll stop there.